The geological edge of evidence suggests the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. They, even if you say like, okay, its civilization is like 9,000 years old, it's still nothing. 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 Yeah. In a completely unexpected site, researchers have uncovered an ancient megastructure visible from orbit. This massive structure challenges traditional notions of past civilizations and their architectural potential. How was such a building constructed in an era supposedly lacking the technology and resources required for such large projects? What function did it serve? And who were the masterminds behind its construction? Join us as we investigate the riddles surrounding this old megastructure visible from space that shouldn't exist. The Great Wall of China is a historical legacy, and many dynasties impacted its course throughout history. It was originally erected to safeguard the country's northern frontier against attacks by northern nomads and tribes, as well as the Mongolian Empire. It also helped to safeguard the Silk Road, an important commerce route connecting China to other regions of Asia and Europe. The Great Wall is no longer required for its intended military function. Instead, it has become a great cultural and historical symbol of China. It attracts millions of tourists each. Year who come to explore and marvel at this ancient wonder, making it one of the most well-known and visited places in the country. The first records of what would become the famous Great Wall date back to the Eastern Zhou Dynasty and detail attempts to reinforce the northern frontiers against invaders. The Qin Dynasty, which emerged around 221 BC, achieved great advancement in wall construction. Emperor Qin Shi Huang oversaw the unification of several regional walls, which were first constructed using tamp soil and local resources, resulting in a cohesive defense structure against northern attacks. This laid the groundwork for the massive expansions that followed. Over the years, several emperors and dynasties constructed, enlarged, and maintained the wall. Soldiers and prisoners provided the majority of the manual labor for the wall's construction. In the 7th century BC, China was made up of several minor nations. The states often invaded each other, and some of them began to build enormous walls to defend their territory. The first such wall was constructed in the state of Chu. Over the centuries that followed, other states would build their own walls. These walls often integrated other natural features, such as dangerous mountain terrain that was already difficult to penetrate to improve their defensive capabilities. The Warring Powers period, which lasted from 475 to 221 BC, was a time when the most powerful powers, Qin, Chu, Zhao, Wei, Qi, Yan, and Han, fought for total power throughout all states. This power tussle lasted a long period, and finally the Qin Dynasty acquired control of a unified China. Around 220 BC, the first emperor of the now united China, Qin Shi Huang, ordered that the walls that divided the several states be demolished because they were causing many issues for people traveling from one location to another. Instead of having several small walls, Qin Shi Huang desired a single huge wall around the country's northern frontier to guard against any invaders who could strike from there. This wall was not called the Great Wall of China. Rather, it was known as Wanli Changcheng, which translates to 10,000 Li Long Wall. Ali is a traditional Chinese unit of measurement for distance that is roughly similar to one third of a mile. Thousands of people, mostly soldiers and criminals, worked together to build the wall. The construction of the wall was overseen by Chinese commander Meng Tian and is regarded as one of the most ambitious projects of its time. Following the death of the first Qin Emperor, construction and modifications to the wall were halted and major parts of the wall collapsed and became useless. The baton passed to the Han Dynasty, who ruled from 206 BC to 220 AD. During this time, the wall was reinforced in order to defend China from invaders and safeguard the Silk Road, a trading route connecting China to Europe and the West. To accomplish this, strong points were placed on the wall, including a beacon every five li, a tower every 10 li, a fort every 30 li, and a castle every 100 li. Throughout the time of the Han, they extended the construction of the wall into Mongolia. This was essential to safeguard the Silk Road, which was critical for trade and strategic mobility during this period. Materials like reeds and willow branches were mixed into the layers of dirt, 
demonstrating an inventive use of available resources to build fortifications. We can't help but think that even then, there was an intention to preserve this monument. The versatility and durability of these materials contributed significantly to the wall's lifetime. This wall stretched to the Mongolian border and was 8,000 kilometers, 5,000 miles long, with branches breaking off at various spots. The wall makes use of both natural resources, such as rivers, and man-made resources, such as pits. Following the fall of the Han Dynasty, the next thousand years were controlled by a variety of dynasties. Each of these dynasties had its own unique way of managing the wall. One of the dynasties, the Northern Wei, who ruled from 385 to 534 AD, worked hard to maintain and reinforce the wall in order to protect themselves against northern tribes. Attacks. They also stretched the wall another 1,000 kilometers, 670 miles to the west. As if that wasn't enough, they erected additional walls to safeguard major cities, although these were lower and thinner than the Great Wall and were made from rammed earth. During the B.I. Qi Kingdom's rule from 550 to 577 AD, development on the Great Wall equaled the magnificence of the Qin Dynasty's early building works. With the B.E.I. Doge Kingdom in power, advancements on the wall, both in terms of extension and maintenance, mirrored the ambitious efforts of the Qin Dynasty, who originally built it. The B.I. Qi Kingdom extended the walls behind the Great Wall to safeguard vital cities. They ensured that they connected seamlessly with the Great Wall itself. Remarkably, a section of the wall near the Taihang Mountains remains intact to this day, standing as a testament to their engineering prowess and strategic foresight. Moving on, during the Sui Dynasty's rule from 581 to 618 AD, the Great Wall underwent substantial renovations to strengthen defenses against the Tujui, a nomadic tribe that threatened the northern boundaries. Despite their short reign, the Sui dynasty left an unforgettable stamp on the wall, overseeing its maintenance and augmentation seven times. This dedication to fortification demonstrates the high priority they placed on securing the realm from foreign assaults during this turbulent period. Between 618 and 907 AD, during the Great Tang Dynasty, an overwhelming military force arose that destroyed the Tuju threat and expanded imperial control well beyond the Northern Wall. As the empire's power grew, the once essential defensive base lost strategic importance. As a result, the intense efforts put into its growth and maintenance reduced as resources were moved to new frontiers of imperial ambition. The Tang Dynasty's military victories not only transformed the geopolitical environment, but also marked a new chapter in the Great Wall drama, representing the subtle dance of power, development, and the unstoppable march of history. Unfortunately, during the Song Dynasty, which reigned from 960 to 1279 AD, the Tang Dynasty's northward advance was lost owing to invasions by the Liao and Jin people, who lived north of the Wall. This restored the Wall's effectiveness as a defensive structure until the Song monarchs were forced to move even further south of the Wall. At this time, expanding or repairing the wall proved futile, and it was abandoned. The Jin Dynasty eventually acquired control of northern China, but they were unable to repel the invading Mongolian Empire, who seized power and established the Yuan Dynasty. Under the Yuan Dynasty, which lasted from 1271 to 1368 AD, the Mongolian Empire ruled over China, large portions of Asia, and even parts of Europe. In this period of expanded imperial power, the Great Wall no longer served its original role as a barrier against exterior threats. Instead, enormous segments of the Wall were abandoned, reduced to quiet sentinels of a bygone era, while a few sections and forts remained important. These fortified bastions were repurposed to protect major commerce routes and subdue any uprisings or rebellions by dissident elements. It represented a shift in the Wall's role from a symbol of protection to a strategic tool of imperial administration. Despite centuries of history, the Great Wall of China, as we know it now, was mostly completed during the Ming era. In truth, the stone masonry linked with China's Great Wall dates back to the Ming period. The Ming dynasty prioritized defense, and with a strong force behind them, they were able to rebuild the wall. They even expanded it by thousands of miles and made it branch off into other locations. 
This secured vital cities and prevented the Mongolian Empire from invading again. The Ming Dynasty lasted from 1368 to 1644 AD. The Great Wall's most comprehensive restoration occurred during the Ming Dynasty following the Mongol invasions. The Ming Dynasty was able to strengthen the wall with stones and bricks and added complex architectural elements, including battlements, watchtowers, garrison posts, and military quarters. This period was responsible for much of what is now known as the Great Wall, which represents the pinnacle of defensive architecture created over centuries. The Qing Dynasty was the final Chinese dynasty, reigning from 1644 to 1911. They dominated areas well beyond the Great Wall's northern borders. China's territorial authority went well beyond the Great Wall's northernmost point. As a result, the wall's protective value diminished once more, leaving it outdated in the eyes of the ruling class. Over time, negligence and disinterest caused the once mighty barrier to gradually crumble, as there was no apparent necessity for its upkeep or continuous development. Despite its historical significance and grandeur, the Great Wall of China has not been spared from the effects of time. The wall, which stretches over 21,196 kilometers, 13,171 miles, has seen centuries of development and crisis. However, major portions of this famous structure have been destroyed or simply crumbled away as a result of time and insufficient upkeep. Despite its fragmentation, the Great Wall continues to be a tribute to human ingenuity and persistence, as well as a lasting emblem of China's rich cultural history and tenacious spirit. Today, the parts of the Great Wall of China that remain are generally from the Ming period. In reality, just 9.4% of the wall is intact for people to walk on. Conservation efforts to safeguard the wall began in the 20th century, and the wall was opened up to tourists in 1970. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, designated the wall as a World Heritage Site in 1987 and in the 2000s it was selected as one of the world's seven modern marvels. Sima Qian's records of the Grand Historian provide an in-depth historical description of these developments. His writings offer vital insights into building processes, strategic imperatives, and, most importantly, the hard and frequently horrific conditions endured by the laborers engaged. This record emphasizes the enormous human labor and huge resources spent during the wall's early phases creating a vivid image of ancient Chinese civilization and its unwavering desire to defend its territory and flourish. Sima Qian's detailed records document the physical building of the Great Wall and dig into the socio-political complexities of the time. All of these provide insight into the reasons and goals that molded this enduring emblem of Chinese culture. The Great Wall's outstanding universal value and all of its qualities are being safeguarded as a whole in order to ensure its authenticity, integrality, and long-term preservation. To that end, given the Great Wall's massive scale, trans-provincial distribution, and complicated conditions for its protection and conservation, management procedures and regulations, conservation interventions for the original fabric and setting, and tourism management are more systematic, scientific, classified, and prioritized. Continuing with historical records, the 20th century was a watershed moment for the Great Wall of China, as systematic archaeological research began to unveil its secrets even more. Teams from China and around the world conducted rigorous studies, uncovering a range of objects and materials. These discoveries have proven critical in dating different sections of the wall and give information on the various building methods used throughout the years. Archaeological excavation revealed that the building materials used varied greatly across the wall. For example, granite was commonly used in the rough northern terrains, reflecting its local richness and durability. In contrast, rammed earth was often used for constructions on flatter plains. This process included compacting layers of soil, known locally as hangu, which was both inexpensive and easily accessible. The variety of materials used demonstrated an adaptable building method geared to the various geographic and resource conditions throughout the length of the wall. Furthermore, the early parts of the Great Wall were not simply earthworks. Timber frames were carefully fitted into these earthen walls to improve structural stability and reduce erosion. However, in areas rich in stone, 
Big stones were used not just as foundational support, but also as principal building elements for most of the structure. Despite its increased susceptibility to decay and fire, wood was used extensively in the building of gates, towers, and wall reinforcements. This multidimensional method of building highlighted the builders' pragmatic creativity as they skillfully adapted their techniques to the diverse geological and climatic circumstances encountered throughout the wall's broad width. As we learn more about the progression of building materials and techniques used on the Great Wall, the Ming Dynasty surfaces as a watershed moment. During this period, there was a noticeable shift toward the widespread use of bricks and stone slabs, resulting in a considerable increase in the wall's longevity and resistance to weathering. The introduction of standardized bricks with consistent sizes and shapes changed the construction process. This provided better ease of handling and laying than the erratic stones used in prior times. The consistency also hastened building efforts and strengthened the wall's overall structural stability, ushering in a new chapter in its long history of engineering innovation. Understanding the enormous need for construction materials, builders cleverly built kilns near construction sites. This strategic choice solved the logistical difficulty of delivering heavy materials across long distances assuring a consistent and efficient supply of bricks for the huge work ahead. It is estimated that these kilns generated hundreds of millions, if not billions of bricks, during the course of the dynasty, each of which played an important role in reinforcing the wall's splendor. Indeed, our understanding of history comprises many riddles and unresolved questions. As we navigate through history, we find puzzling events that cannot be interpreted with the framework of existing information. One of the most intriguing developments was the invention of the sticky rice mortar. During the Ming Dynasty, architects began combining a sticky rice paste with lime to create this revolutionary substance. The end product was a mortar that not only held bricks together more efficiently, but also had increased water resistance and strength. This organic inorganic composite was groundbreaking, making the wall considerably more sturdy than many had expected. Recent research has highlighted the efficiency of this mortar, indicating its remarkable capacity to bear tremendous pressure and resist aging, which is why many portions of the wall remain strong today. Building the Great Wall of China was not just a tremendous architectural feat, but also a massive human enterprise. Over multiple dynasties, millions of people worked to build it, including soldiers, peasants, prisoners, and even academics who had fallen out of favor with those in authority. These laborers had to endure extremely difficult working conditions, such as limited resources, harsh weather, and rigorous physical effort. Over one million people died from weariness and starvation during the severe winter months. Historical records even state that some of the deceased were buried within the wall itself. This birthed the belief that the wall is the world's greatest graveyard. In stark contrast, the Bingham Canyon Mine also known as the Kennecott Copper Mine, is a modern masterpiece of engineering. Nestled in the rocky expanse of the Oquir Mountains, southwest of Salt Lake City, Utah, this mine is visible even from space. It has been a symbol of industrial strength since its inception in 1966. Bingham Canyon has a long and fascinating history centered on its legendary copper mine. Established in 1848 by the audacious Bingham brothers, Thomas and Sanford, at the request of Brigham Young. The region was first used as vast landfields for cattle and horses, as well as a location for forestry activities. However, the calm scenery suffered a profound disruption in 1863 with the unexpected discovery of gold and silver, sparking a veritable mining frenzy that turned the canyon into a thriving industrial town. In 1873, the Bingham Canyon and Camp Floyd Railroad wasn't completed which spurred the mining boom by making it easier to transport important materials. Over time, the focus switched to copper extraction, which became the backbone of the region's economy. The Bingham Canyon mine grew to become one of the world's largest open pit mines. As mining technology improved, allowing for deeper and more effective extraction methods, the mine's importance grew. For more than a century, the mine has been an important part of Utah's mining history representing the industry's long-lasting impact in the American West. It now serves as a symbol of the region's perseverance and ingenuity. Its actual origins date back to 1898, when Enos Andrew Wall established the Boston Consolidated Mining Company, 
laying the framework for what would become a mining juggernaut. The mine's environment changed abruptly in 1910 when the Kennecott Copper Corporation acquired it, signaling the start of large-scale activities that continue to this day. This rich past makes it one of the oldest and most productive mines in the United States, a magnificent example of human endeavor and resource exploitation on a grand scale. Bingham Canyon is predominantly an open pit mine, which excavates vast open pits to access mineral resources below the surface. This strategy has resulted in significant technological improvements at the mine, such as the first use of large-scale electric shovels in 1926 and the introduction of haul trucks in 1937. These inventions transformed the flow of materials throughout the mine, increasing efficiency and output. Over time, the mine has become the world's leading producer of copper, producing more than 20 million tons in total. However, copper isn't the only material collected here. The mine has also produced considerable quantities of gold, silver, and molybdenum, reinforcing its position as a worldwide mining powerhouse. The mine's influence extends far beyond its production. The vast excavation has given scientists a unique cross-section of the Earth's crust, providing significant insights into geological layers and the genesis of metal deposits. This has considerably enhanced the science of economic geology, increasing our understanding of the natural processes that shape our world. Another noteworthy element of the mine is its impact on air navigation. The excavation's sheer enormity has disrupted the surrounding gravitational field to the point that compass readings can become unreliable for aircraft flying above. This gigantic trench has a great impact on the terrain and the magnetic field in its surroundings, demonstrating the immense influence of human activity on Earth's natural processes. Furthermore, the mine is the world's largest human-made excavation and deepest open pit mine, producing more copper than any other mine in history, more than 19 million short tons, 17 million long tons. The mine is controlled by the Rio Tinto Group, a British-Australian multinational enterprise. Kennecott Utah Copper Corporation manages Bingham Canyon Mines copper activities, which include the mine, concentrator facility, smelter, and refinery. The mine has been in operation since 1906, resulting in the formation of a hole that is 0.75 miles deep, 2.5 miles broad, and covers 1,900 acres. To put it in perspective, the hole is so vast that two of the world's tallest structures, the Burj Khalifa, could be stacked end-to-end -end at its base and still be overshadowed by the excavation's Rikosa scale. The mines in Bingham Canyon in the 19th century were relatively small, but by the end of the century, large-scale extraction had begun through open pit mining. In 1896, Samuel Newhouse and Thomas Weir purchased the Highland Boy Mine, which was rich in copper, silver, and gold. They launched Utah Consolidated Gold Mines Limited with English investors, then founded Boston Consolidated Gold and Copper Company Limited to explore low-grade copper ore. In 1903, Daniel C. Jackling and Eno Saywall established the Utah Copper Company, which marked a watershed moment. The business rapidly built a pilot mill in Copperton near the canyon's mouth and began mining operations in 1906. Jackling's decision in 1904 to use open pit mining, steam shovels, and the railroad was the key to Utah Copper's success in harvesting the massive but low-grade porphyry copper ore deposit at Bingham Canyon. This strategy turned the mine into a showpiece for railroad pit operations, and by 1912, the industrial complex, which included the American Smelting and Refining Company, a Sarko smelting business, was the world's largest industrial mining complex. Asarco is a mining, smelting, and refining firm headquartered in Tucson, Arizona, that mines and processes principally copper. Utah Copper and Boston Consolidated joined operations in 1906 when their respective surface activities began to converge. The Kennecott Copper Corporation, which was founded to handle mines in Kennecott, Alaska, bought a 25% financial interest in Utah Copper in 1915 and increased its holding to 75% by 1923. Throughout the 1920s, Bingham Canyon grew significantly and became a thriving center of activity. The region hosted around 15,000 individuals of various ethnicities in huge residential villages perched on the sheer canyon cliffs. 
However, as mining techniques developed, the population rapidly decreased and many mining settlements were absorbed by the growing mine. By 1980, only Copperton, located near the canyon's mouth and home to 800 people, remained. By 1911, there were 21 different mining enterprises, which were combined into two corporations in 1970, Kennecott and the Anaconda Minerals Company. Kennecott's Utah Copper ceased open pit mining operations in 1985, but gold was found in adjacent Barney's Canyon the following year. So Ohio purchased Kennecott Copper Corporation in 1981, and the mine reopened in 1987, when BP Minerals took over the assets. In 1989, the Rio Tinto Group took ownership and modernized the mine, mill, and smelter. The use of conveyor belts and pipes to replace an antiquated 1,000-car train system saved expenses by roughly 30%, allowing the enterprise to return to profitability. Kennecott's Bingham Canyon Mine is the world's biggest man-made excavation, viewable with the naked eye from a circling space shuttle. The mine employs around 2,000 people and extracts a remarkable 450,000 short tons, 400,000 long tons of material every day. The ore is loaded onto 64 huge dump trucks using electric shovels with a capacity of 98. Short tons, 88 long tons for each scoop. Each of these gigantic trucks, which cost around $3 million each, can deliver 255 short tons, 228 long tons of ore at one time. A five-mile, eight-kilometer conveyor system transports the ore to the Copperton Concentrator and Flotation Facility. The longest conveyor in this network is an astounding three miles, 4.8 kilometers. This complex technology shows the mining operation's great scale and efficiency allowing for the continuous processing of massive amounts of ore. In addition to its size and capacity, the Bingham Canyon mine has had a great influence on geology. The excavation has given scientists an unprecedented cross-section of the Earth's crust and provides crucial information on geological layers and mineral deposit forms. This has enhanced the science of economic geology, increasing our understanding of the natural processes that shape our world. Another noteworthy element of the mine is its impact on aircraft navigation. The massive sinkhole has disrupted the surrounding gravity field to the point where pilots flying overhead may get inaccurate compass readings. This distinguishing feature emphasizes the immense extent of the excavation and its influence on the surrounding environment. The Bingham Canyon mine was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1966 as the Bingham Canyon Open Pit Copper Mine. The mine had a massive landslide in April 2013, followed by a smaller but still impactful one in September of the same year. The mine is still in operation today, and it is open to visitors and tourists. Its visitor experience tour was closed after the landslide in April 2013, but it was reopened in April 2024. There are many exhibits to be seen that will aid a better understanding of the magnificence of the Bingham Canyon mine. Thank you for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, click on the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.